Okay, so welcome back to my channel. I am Jason, and this is from Sin's Perspective Reviews. So I just watched the first episode of Fate, the Winx Saga, uh, on Netflix, and you know I I have mixed feelings. So if you're interested in hearing what I have to say, stay tuned. Okay, so the episode opens with a shepherd going to check on his sheep. <laughs> uh, the sheep were making a lot of noise, so he went out to investigate. And he counted them and he realized that a couple were missing and he just assumed that they had wandered into the woods. So he went into the woods and as soon as he stepped into the woods, you could see that he had crossed some type of force field, some type of barrier or something. So he's out looking for the sheep. He eventually comes to this tree and of course he looks up and he sees his, his uh, sheep dead uh, in the tree and the blood is running all down the tree and the whole thing. And so he started, he heard this noise, this rustling and growling and eventually saw what it was and he, he tried to run for it but alas he did not make it and uh he was killed by whatever this thing is at this point we have we can only hear what it, hear this thing we have uh they we were not able to see what it was so it flashed to a school this is clearly like move in day it's a a, a private school clearly and um it focuses on this one student uh, Bloom, she's you know coming through the gates, and of course it's all that's going on. You see the uh, the students there; they're all kind of milling around. You know, how you, you know people you do when you go back to school, and your friends that you haven't seen in a while, and you know people are doing the selfies, and of course people dragging their luggage and the whole thing. And so uh, Bloom is just taking it all in, and I guess eventually you know she did look like she was kind of uh, I don't say lost, but okay, I guess we use that word lost. So, uh, uh, Sky, uh, saw her and started up a conversation with her and eventually, you know, t uh, explained to her where, you know, the buildings were located and she was trying to go to the, I guess, the fairy building. So while she was talking to Sky, um, a character that we would come to know as Stella, you can see she was standing off in the distance just watching. So eventually, uh, Bloom, uh, walks away. Um, to go to the ferry building and what you know she was actually supposed to meet Sky. Sky is supposed to kind of I guess show her around and uh, kind of let her know about you know some of the goings on on uh, on uh, the campus and so I mean they didn't really talk that long as you know she you know basically uh, told her that you know there are seven realms and uh, was it Althea is the realm that they're in It's the realm I guess that the school is in and I guess you know she should consider uh, Alfie her her new home but they didn't really interact that much and so the next time you saw uh, Bloom she was in the headmistress office and so you know they were talking and she uh, Bloom was like you know uh, I, I wonder if you could hear that my heat is on it is freezing in here uh, but Bloom is, you know, they're talking um, about uh, fairies and uh, Bloom is like, well, I thought that we would have wings and, this, you know, this whole thing and the headmistress was like, well, we used to have wings, but a lot of our magic was lost and anyway, you're a fire witch. So we find out that Bloom is a fire witch and, you know, she's telling her that classes start to, uh, the next day. So I thought, wait a minute, that's kind of confusing. Like, why would you have... I mean, I get this. I mean, I understand it's a show. But it's like, why are you having students move in the day before classes start? I don't be getting it. Okay, they should have at least a good two or three days to get settled in, right? But anywho, the classes start tomorrow, and uh, we're going to uh, start slow and uh, slow and steady. And so Bloom had an issue with that. She, you know, felt like uh, she ends up telling the headmistress Dowling that. You know, I, you know, basically I get that Alfie is a great place, but it's not my home. And I only came here because you told me that you could, uh, help me control my powers. And she ends up telling Bloom, like, no, you came here because you didn't have any other choice. Um, and so there was some mention of some incident. They didn't go into great detail, but something happened that drew her, their attention. And which is why Bloom is there, uh, Bloom is there now. So... 
uh, Bloom is now in her room. It's like a suite mate situation. There are five uh, students per, um, per room. And, you know, while she's unpacking some of her things, she's talking to her parents. And you find out that she, her parents think that she's in some uh, Swiss boarding school. And uh, they feel think that she's in the Alps. And so Aisha, one of her roommates, uh, they were, uh, I think the parents are asking, like, well, why, what time is it there? Why is it so bright? And Aisha went over and did something with the lights and was like, oh, okay, it's time for uh, lights out or something. And so that was it. She was able to hurry your parents off the phone. And then she asked her, like, why do your parents think you're in the Alps? And she's like, well, my parents, both my parents are uh, human. You know, they, uh, the school, I guess people think that, you know, obviously there's a dormant uh, bloodline in here somewhere, but, and apparently I got, I got the, uh, the, the genes and my parents didn't. So, okay. Now, okay. Another issue. How is it that your child is going off to a foreign school that you have never seen? Why do you think that she's in the Alps? And why, I, I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused. Like, how does this all work, right? So if they're human, did you just, did, did they not have to go to the school to register you to, you know, to see the campus? Like, how exactly did you get into this school? And, but they think that you're somewhere else. I mean, oh, okay. I guess we're, we're to assume that they've used uh, magic to make this happen. I, okay. It was, okay. That was, that's weird to me. So anyway, Bloom is on her way out of the room, um, walking, I guess it looked like she had a little shower kit or something. I don't know where she was going, but she walked past, um, Stella's, uh, room and she saw Stella kind of deciding on what she was going to wear. And Stella was telling her that there's an event, uh, that night and she has to, uh, she's trying to decide what to wear. And, and Bloom was like, well, I thought you said it was casual. And she said, it is, but you know, people expect this, people expect me to look nice. And she, you know, did some type type of magic and this, or I guess this, I guess she could have more light or something. I don't know. And Stella uh, Bloom was asking her, like, you know, how did she make that happen? And uh, Stella kind of snipped at her a little bit, like, you know, I'm a mentor, not a tutor. But then she tells her that your magic is connected to your emotions. And basically, basically the stronger the emotions, the stronger the magic. And so she was like, so I guess you dislike me. And she's like, why do you say that? And she said, well, um, you were talking to me when you were able to manifest whatever this light is. And she was like, well, no, that's not what it is. And I'm sure that once I get to know you, I'm going to find something to love. Oh, I'll learn to love you or something, she said. So uh, Stella ends up going out to the common room where we are introduced to Tara. Tara is a uh, earth fairy. And so she's like decorating the common room. She got all these plants. And so Stella's like, okay, Tara, this is, a, this is the common area. And so they talk, they trade, you know, words back and forth. And eventually Tara decides she's going to move some of the plants. So the person who's right next to Tara is Musa. And Musa was like, wow, that, you know, she, you know, she made comment about how uh, Stella snapped at Tara. And Tara was basically like, you know, I'm not worried, you know, really worried about it. You know, that's just how she is. And, and, uh, uh, Tara likes to talk a lot. And so she revealed that, um, Stella is a second year student. So Stella, okay. Stella, um, Aisha and Musa, Aisha, Musa and Bloom are second year, uh, students. And what I thought was weird was that, okay, so Musa was like, okay, so if she's a second year student, then why is she in, the, in here with first year? But then in that same conversation, Tara revealed that she was there last year also. So wouldn't that make her a second year student? So, okay. Anywho, so you can kind of tell that Musa, um, uh, she's not a big talker. And, uh, she was, you know, trying to put her headphones on, but then she wasn't trying to be rude. And, and then eventually, uh, she did get the headphones on and, uh, Tara was saying something to her, but she didn't respond. Um, eventually Aisha walked in and asked, uh, Tara if there was a place, um, that she can swim. She swims twice a day and she'll usually go to the river, but she wants some place that's closer. And... 
uh, Tara ends up telling her it, you could uh, go to the pond, but that's, uh, I mean, if you, you know, like if you're desperate, there's a pond where the specialist trained, train, but nobody, you know, really swims in, <laughs> swims in that. And that, no, well, not by choice anyway. Um, so we flash to the specialist training. This is where we see uh, Sky and Revy and, of course, a lot of other people. And so we realize, okay, so now we know that uh, Revy and Sky are specialists, whatever that means at this point. And so they're, like, doing combat training and the whole thing. And uh, Sky is making comments about Bloom. I guess he, you know, still thinking about her. And Revy, Revy was like, you know, she's a redhead, so they're crazy. They're all crazy. And, you know, they're going, you know, guy talk like, oh, so now you're an expert on redheads or whatever. And so, you know, they talk a little bit. And then eventually you they flash to... Okay, on when you look up his character name, I need to maybe I need to go to IMDb because it said Silva, but in the episode he was they call he uh the headmistress called him Saul. Okay, so um he is actually responsible for training the specialist. And so I guess he had a you know role a first year there, and he's basically telling them that you know you're here because either you're a legacy, um, you earned your way in, or I you were personally selected by me for your combat, uh for your combat skills. And basically I expect nothing less. And so, um oh my god, what is his name? Uh, what is the young guy name? He, it was, the young guy, he started laughing and Simba was like, I, do you, uh, do you find, uh, what do you find so funny? And he said, I think it's funny, you know, that we're in this castle and we're fighting with swords and <clears throat> and something to that effect. And so Simba ended up asking him, uh, have you ever seen a burned one? And so he was like, well, nobody from my generation has. And then Simba goes into this whole story about how he and his father was out in the woods chopping wood and one came uh, came upon them. And uh, the, his father ends up shooting. He shot the creature uh, three times, but nothing happened. And uh, the thing is, if you get cut by these, um, these burned ones, it's an extremely painful and agonizing death. And so you should... Pray that if you ever encounter one, that they kill you so that it saves your family, your loved ones from having to do it. I guess because you're in so much pain, they, I guess they put you, they, and there, I guess there's no cure for it. They, they feel like they need to put you out of your misery. And so his whole attitude changed. Now, while he's telling the story, Robbie went outside the boundaries. Why he felt need to go out into the wood, the boundaries to smoke, I have no idea. I'm assuming all these students know that these boundaries are in place to protect them. But he went out into the woods and he, he didn't stray far, but the fact that he went out there so he can have a cigarette. And then he started hearing weird noises and, and then eventually he looked over and he found the shepherd's body. So, uh, headmistress Silva and Ben, they're now out there looking at the body and Ben is saying that uh, there's char on the body, so they now know that it's a burned one, or they, they are speculating. They don't really want to think that it is, but the headmistress was like, you know what, just get this cleaned up, and so we can, uh, the boundary look, the boundary is going to hold, or we, we're hoping that the barrier holds. Um, it seems like everybody's safe for the time being, just get this cleaned up, and so we can, you know, figure out what's uh, really going on here. So at the gathering... Musa, uh, Aisha, and uh, Tara, they're talking about the events. And uh, Tara ends up saying, well, how do you know he wasn't just old? People die all the time. And basically, it was like his head was, you know, <laughs> almost he was almost decapitated. And uh, I mean, clearly, he didn't, he didn't die of old age. And so you saw um, Aisha packing. She was like, packing the cookies the carbs up and so she was you know she because she swims a lot um she needs uh the calories and so uh musa ends up saying oh you were not kidding you swim twice a day every day huh and so you kind of see tara's face and so aisha walks off with her booty all her cookies and stuff and she ends up saying to uh musa oh so you heard her and Musa was like, what do you mean? She was like, well, when I was talking to you, you act like you couldn't hear me, but you heard her, you know, talking about her swim schedule. And then Musa was like, uh, well, you know, I sometimes I just, I put my headphones on when I don't want to talk. 
And um, it's not it's not you. It's really me. She was trying to do the whole thing. And at that point, Tara, you could tell that she her feelings were hurt, and she kind of walked off. And you find out that Ben is her father. So as he was walking through the gathering, she walked over to him and asked him if he needed help. Um, in the uh, in the um, <clears throat> oh my God, my brain. Oh Lord, he, if he needed help, he is the one to deal with the the the, the plants and whatnot. And so she's asking him if he needed to oh, the greenhouse. And so <laughs> I think it's what he said. And so she asked him if he needed help. And he told her, no, you will not be hiding out in the greenhouse. You need to gather, you need to uh, socialize. And, you know, it's, a, it's time for you to have a good time and, you know, enjoy yourself. And so, you know, he smiled. She kind of sm smiled and he uh, walked off. And he kind of walked off like, you know, go and, you know, make some friends. So we go to the headmaster's office and mistress office. And her secretary, uh, he was kind of busy. He was digging through his desk for something. And so a young lady we now know as Beatrice, she walks over and knocks on the door. And so he's telling her that, you know, if the door's closed and the headmistress is busy. And then she puts in a drink order. Like he's just supposed to, you know, jump to it. And of course he was offended. And eventually the headmistress came to the door. And, you know, she started going, you know, introduced herself as Beatrice and how, you know, she admires the headmistress and how, you know, she's always admired her. She's like her biggest fan and, and how, um, uh, how she's, uh, studied her and, um, basically just, uh, I don't really know. It's kind of an odd situation. And so eventually the headmistress kind of glanced over at the receptionist and he just kind of behind her like, And so she um, was basically saying that she studied her. And so the headmistress was basically like, you know, I'm busy right now. So if you want to learn more about me, then you find, you know, you're going to have to find out in the library. And she closed the door. And you can kind of tell that she was not happy about that. But at the same time, girl, but she, this is the headmistress. Like, she's supposed to stop to entertain you. I, I really believe she really believed that. Like, okay. Anywho, so... Um... Bloom is at sitting at her desk and eventually she starts having this flashback of her and her mother. Her and her mother got into an argument. And the argument was because Bloom pretty much stayed in her room. And, you know, her parents were worried about her. She wasn't going out to socialize. She didn't have any friends. I mean, it was normal uh, concerns, legitimate concerns. And so her mom was telling her, you know, maybe you should get out and go to a movie and uh, you know, do something other than like going to antiquing or going to rummage sales. And then she says to her mom, all right, so you want me to be a basic bitch like you? And then her mom says, I guess it's better than being a weird loner. And then she has the gall to say, wow, you know, you know, calling your daughter a weird loner, great parenting. I'm like, girl, you just called your mother a basic bitch. You better be glad she just slapped your damn face off. At least that's what my mom would have done. And then I was like, wow, sometimes teenagers are a hoot and a holler. And then her mom just basically said, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just worried about you. And so she tells her that if you had more going on in your sad life, then you wouldn't have the time to worry about what's going on in mine. And she slammed the door in her mother's face. It's like, ooh, chow. So uh, Bloom is later on that evening. Bloom finally goes down to the party and she sees Sky. Uh, she wanted to go out, you know, and out past the boundaries out into the forest. And they started talking. He's telling her how it's not safe. And, you know, kind of, I guess, I think he was flirting with her a little bit. Like, so are you asking me, you know, to accompany you? And she she really wasn't. But um, while they were talking, Stella walked over and, and interrupted the conversation and uh, pulled Sky to the side. And so uh, Bloom just went on and left. And so Stella and Sky are now talking and... She tells him that uh, you can't, basically, she's telling him that Bloom is her sweet mate. And he's like, well, what does that mean? Uh, so what, I can't talk to her, can't even talk to her because she uh, she's your sweet mate? And he basically got loud. You could, you know, other people are, you know, can hear now. And she, she's basically jealous and she really doesn't want uh, Sky uh, to have anything to do with, uh, with Bloom. Um, and he eventually, you know, he eventually walked away and she ends up talking to, telling the, uh, the other people like, oh, did you enjoy the show? And she kind of walked off. 
So Bloom left. He went. She she went out, went um, past the boundaries, and it flashed back and forth between her and Aisha. Aisha is in the river swimming, um, and I think she saw. She had to have seen Bloom. Uh, seen Bloom. Um, so Bloom finally finds this open space. She wants to see if she can uh, manifest her powers and control them. And so she, you know, tr attempted. Um, it, she she made the first attempt. It didn't work. She pulled out her cell phone and she started scrolling through because um, Stella was saying that your magic is connected to emotion. She was trying to find like a photo or something that was going to, I guess, evoke some emotion in her so she can do this. And so you flash to this burnt house and then you realize, okay, hmm, did she do that? Is that what they were talking about when she was talking to the headmistress? So she saw this, uh, so she was looking at these photos and all of a sudden, you know, she was able to, now she had the phone, her cell phone in one hand, but somehow she had enough control to only have to make the fire, fire uh, manifest in the other hand. And then she puts the phone in her back pocket and now she has the fire in both hands. And she was, you know, feeling good and like, oh, I got this. And then suddenly it starts to get out of control. Around this time, Aisha is walking up and she's asking her, like, what are you doing? They start going back and forth because Bloom is telling her, you know, I, you know, I can't control this. You should probably go because, you know, I don't want you to get hurt. And uh, Aisha's trying to calm her down. And, you know, cause you know, her emotions, you know, the more, the more upset she get, the worse the, the fire get. Next thing you know, this fire is coming out towards Aisha. And then you realize that, you know, Aisha is a water witch. So she was able to produce the water to put the fire out. And so, which makes sense because, you know, like she said, she swims, uh, she loves being in the water. She swims twice a day. So, um... Aisha and Bloom, they get back to the school. Of course, Aisha is telling her how irresponsible and rid ridiculous that was that, you know, somebody could have gotten hurt. And Bloom is saying, that's why I went out into the woods. And, you know, she's, you know, telling her, basically reading her the right like that was, that was stupid and you should not have done that. And um, um, Aisha ends up going into a story, uh, her story of when she, uh, her, but, I think when she first uh, manifested her powers or something, she flooded her entire school, even the toilets. And she was like, do you know what it's like to wade through shit? And Bloom was like, no. Uh, well, no, no. She was like, well, sometimes that's what it is to be a fairy or, you know, it's just, sometimes you go through shit. And so Bloom starts going into, you know, her the relationship that she has with her mother. And then she starts talking about, the night the fire fire happened so we flashed to her bedroom door being removed her father took her door off and of course bloom um is upset like why are you doing this and the mom was like well you slam a door you lose the door because remember she called her mother a basic bitch and then slammed the door in her face and the dad is like you know you shutting us out we don't you know we don't really know what's you know going on with you and the mom of course you know that whole interaction she was like no so uh, she was like, so what do you think the way to, you know, to teach me a lesson is to evade my privacy and the, uh, her and her mom traded, uh, the mom basically said what she had to say and basically told her if she keeps talking that she's, that's going to be even longer. She's going to be without a door and they walked off. So later that night, she stood over that the entire day later that night, she was able to create this fire that basically consumed their entire house, almost killed her parents. You know, her mom has a lot of third degree burns. Uh, she was actually, when by the time she got to her parents' room, it was covered in fire. How she was even able to get through that fire, I mean, uh, but the mom at this point, I think, was unconscious from smoke inhalation and it was just, uh, it was a whole mess. So, um, uh, they st they, her and I used to continue to talk and she's like, well, I'm not sure how distant my fairy relatives are. And so Aisha was like, that's kind of odd um, that you would, that it would be dormant because for someone who, um, for someone who, uh, with the dormant, so who has a dormant, I guess, dormant bloodline, you were able to manifest a lot of powers. So she was like, are you sure that you're not, um, adopted? And she was like, no, I'm, you know, no, I'm not adopted. She was like, so, you know, she, then she said that, you know, my, they talked about my birth all the time, how I was this miracle baby. I was born with a heart defect and, you know, the day after it, um, had completely healed.
another issue. Like, girl, and what the universe do? Some in some heart defect heal overnight. So Aisha was like, Oh my god, um, I think that you're a changeling. And so, of course, uh, Boom was like, What's a changeling? She was like, Well, it's a practice that disappeared a long time ago. It's barbaric, it's where a fairy, uh, a fairy will exchange their baby for uh, a fairy child for a human child. And so, um, uh, Bloom got upset. She basically was like, no, my parents are my parents. And so she walked off. And as she was walking off, she kind of brushed past Musa. And Musa was like, what did you say to her? And Aisha was like, I told her the truth because somebody is apparently lying to her. And then you flash to the headmistress. And she's in her office. You know, she poured coffee. And she closed her door. You know, she's at the with the wave of a finger. And then, you know, she moved her bookcase there. It's like this tunnel. Uh, uh, it's a hidden a secret passage that she went down. Where did she go? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Um. So, down at the party, uh, you can see uh, Dane. Is his name Dana? A Dane? The young guy? Um. So he's standing off by himself with his little glass of orange juice. And then you see Revy. And then Revy walks over there with his flask and Spikes Boy's orange juice. And, you know, uh, he drinks the um, orange juice. And Revy is now push, trying to push the cup so he can, like, drink the entire thing. So Tara uh, saw this. And she basically said, that's a shame that you're bullying first year. And she was like, he acts like you act like such a tough guy. But just last year you were... Um, uh, you were pretending not to be a nerd, or something. She something to, to that effect. What did you say? You were you were pretending to not be a nerd. Oh, you were a ner you were a nerd in disguise. And then he says to her, "And you are three people in disguise." And so that was clearly a dig at her weight. She's plus size. And Dana was about to jump in, but she was like, "No, no, I got this." So she basically told you know read him to act like you think that be you know, that. Uh, People always feel like they can say whatever they want to say to um, big... What did she didn't say? Fat. Did she say fat? People always think that they can say what they want to big girls. And because they always think that we're nice and harmless and, you know, the whole thing. But she was like, you'll find... But what they fail to realize, uh, you know, something that we are, have bad days too. And, you know, eventually she ends up, he, uh, River was leaning up against the wall that had these branches. And remember, uh, Tara is a earth fairy. And so she basically wrapped those twins around his neck. And basically, I'm like, she wasn't trying to kill him, but she was trying to make a point. And then eventually she let him go. And he was like, you could have killed me, you freak. And then she says, I missed you too. And he, he storms off. And so, uh, Dane, poor little thing, he was like, uh, he, he, he ends up getting sick. So she ends up having to help him to the bathroom because whatever that alcohol was, whatever it was he drank, did not agree with him. So later that night, um, Bloom was looking up, I guess she was trying to research what a changeling actually is. And then she started looking at a photo of her family. So around this time, Stella walks in. And then she starts talking to her about family and how, you know, her parents make her go there even though she doesn't want to and how she understands what it's like to want to be home. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. And so the next thing you see um, Aisha and Musa, they're coming into the room. Musa is saying that she's not, that uh, Bloom is not responding to her text. And Musa was like, maybe it's because she poured her heart out to you and you called her a freak. So they end up going into Zella's room and asking Zella if she'd seen her. And she basically said, no, I haven't seen her recently. So then we find out that Musa is a, I think they say a mind fairy. So she could kind of, I guess, read emotions or something. And she was telling Stella, like your face, you know, your face is uh, saying one thing, but you, uh, you, your face, your facial expressions are calm, but I can see that you're racked with guilt. And so around this time, Tara walked in. And uh, they started talking about, they filled her in on Bloom being missing. And then Bloom, uh, Tara was like, wait a minute. Bloom was talking to Sky, And she was like, so? She was like, so I know, I remember the last time, the last time, what happened the last time a girl, you caught a girl talking to Sky. So she's like, what did you do with uh, Bloom? And so she originally told her that she loaned her her ring because 
Stella has a uh, a ring that opens doors into, I guess the where the world they live in is called the other world. So I guess the normal world. And um, so they started talking like, okay, first of all, you can only use that ring outside the barrier, and you have to go in deep into the woods, and then there's this cemetery in this this particular place that you have to go to in order to uh, uh f that has a, a portal that you could use to go into the other world. And so you flash to Bloom. So she, you know, while this is going on, she went through the door and uh, she walked into the warehouse. Because when she was talking to Aisha, she t did tell her that after the fire, she was afraid to sleep in the house with her parents. So every night she would sneak out and she would go and sleep in this warehouse because she was afraid that she would set the house on fire again. And so she, so when she went through the portal, it took her to the warehouse where she stayed. The thing is, she didn't close the door when she went through. So she went through the door from the other world into, I guess, the real world. And then went out into the real world. Went from the, the warehouse into the real world. And she's now, she was standing outside her parents' house and she was calling them. And they talked a little bit. And uh, it was emotional. You know, they basically told her that they loved her. And they you basically feel like she could do whatever she, you know, wants to do. And, you know, basically they're going to be there to support her. And it was a good conversation. And, you know, she could see them. They were sitting at the dining room table. And then her mom lifted up. You know, she kind of lowered her uh, sweater. And she could see that you could see the, some of the burns that she um, sustained that night. And then eventually, you know, the conversation ended. And she went back to the warehouse. And so instead of going back immediately, she kind of hung around and there was like some journal there that she left there that she started to read and she started hearing this noise and she looked, she uh, decided to investigate and then she saw this monster standing there, which I'm assuming, which we find out is the burned one. And so she ends up getting startled. Of course, she dropped uh, Stella's ring. She ends up going down the grate, having to drop down, jump down the grate. Uh, to get away, you, she could kind of see the ring, but it was on the other side of another grave, so she couldn't actually get to it. And then she ends up having to leave the ring behind. As soon as she come came out of uh, the uh, tunnel, you can see the headmistress there, and she basically told her to keep going, keep running, and go out the door. And the headmistress stayed behind to fight uh, the burned one. So as she got out of the warehouse, Aisha, uh, Tara, and Musa was there. And they explained to her that that was the burn that 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 was uh what is what they call a burned one, and then she asked where Stella was, and they said, well, she's back at the room. Why? They're like because the monster, basically the burned one, has her ring. So we don't know what's going to happen with that. Okay, so we flash to Sky's room. Sky just got out of the shower. He walks into his bedroom. Stella is there, and uh, he's um basically telling her asking her why she was there and telling her you know basically I haven't heard from you all summer and you broke up with me and you know this you know you can't do this you can't be here and she's basically laying on well you know I know when you know, I did something awful and everybody hates me and you know I can't go back there tonight because I think they think I'm a horrible person well yeah because you sent uh bloom out into the woods without explaining to her the dangers and you did the shit on purpose. So, okay. So, she's telling him that, you know, he she, she just doesn't, she just wants to spend the night there. And then he's like, you know, you're a better person that people uh, give you credit for, but you have to show it. And I'm like, shut up. So, uh, Bloom, Musa, and Aisha, they and Tara, they get back to their room. And, you know, they talked for a little while. They looked like, you know, they had been through it. Their eyes are ball bugged out. And they basically said that, you know, the headmistress, headmistress is going to take care of everything and most likely get the ring back. And Bloom, uh, it looks like she just went off to bed. Uh, so there was this snippet, this scene um, where Riv uh, Riven was outside smoking and Beatrice came out of, I guess, the library. She had a handful of books. And he was like burning the midnight oil, I see, or something to that effect. They, uh, they talked a little bit and they did one of those where you would smoke, you blow smoke in the other person's mouth and they inhale. And he was like, and you're a first year, right? And she was like, you know, I, I'm a lot of things. And she kind of wandered off. So he's kind of like eyeing her nail, like she, you know, something. But anywho, 
So back at the room, you know, everybody's getting ready for bed. And Tara ends up telling to saying Musa, like she talks to her brother and her brother ends up giving her the speaker. Like she understands why she wants, uh, that she needs her quiet time. And, um, she ends up wanting to give her these speakers. So, you know, like, I understand you want your quiet time, but you don't have to go through it alone. And she didn't get the reaction she wanted from, uh, Musa. And Musa ends up telling her, you know, don't be, you know, don't be, uh, upset. And she was like, I'm not, she was like, you know what? Just cut the phony act. And so Tara was like, no, I am, I'm naturally happy. She was like, I'm an, and I'm an empath. This is, uh, Musa, I'm an empath. I feel your anxiety that you, the anxiety that you have with me. I feel the insecurities that you have when you're around Stella. Uh, and I feel that, um, the, I feel the anger that you're, that you're, uh, you're, um, dealing with now. She was like, I put my headphones on because basically all day I'm having to deal with and filter out everybody's emotions. And I'm able, you know, when I put my headphones on, I'm allowed to cut all of, shut all of that off and focus on myself. And, um, Tara kind of just, uh, I think she understood. Um, I don't know. That was kind of a weird thing. Like her reaction. I don't know, but I don't know where that's going to go. Um, uh, but you know, it makes sense. Like everybody's ability is different and it, imp and it affects them differently. So I don't know if, because Stella, I don't know if she, because she's an earth, was she, is she just more sensitive? I don't really know how, to, I'm not into all that. Somebody else who's into all that stuff would have to leave that in the comment section. Um, so, uh, later that night. Dowling and Silver are in her office and they're talking and she's told him that she has the burn one chain to a bar outside the barrier. And he was like, you should have just killed it. She was like, well, I couldn't uh, just kill it and leave it in the other world. He was like, well, you should have brought it back here and killed it. And so she basically said no because she had been whipped something up to knock the creature out for a few hours. And she wants to ask them uh, questions because she thinks that there's more to it. And she ends up telling him that she found a changeling out in the real world. She was like uh, 16 years ago um, when this changeling was left. That was the last time we saw a burned one. And so she's figuring like, okay, we're seeing them again. So something is afoot. Um, and so the last scene is we see this person walking through the woods. They are wearing this cloak. And they use some power, electricity, I don't know what it was, to jolt this monster awake. And then they remove their hood and you realize it's Beatrice. So we now know that Beatrice is there for nefarious reasons. And that's pretty much how this episode ends. Um, I don't dislike the show. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to watch a few more episodes. But I'm going to end this here and I will talk to you guys later.